I'm Christiane Stretkan. I'm from the National Museum of Denmark. And I work in the conservation department as, uh, and as uh, we were told, we were going to change a bit now and dive into the material, the building material, and um, what is now called the waterlogged archaeological wood. And I'm going to bring you back to, to the classroom again and uh, give you a brief introduction on waterlogged archaeological wood, its degradation and the challenges. Uh, I'll talk a bit about uh, characterization prior to conservation, a bit about conservation and post-conservation uh, considerations. Uh, I will not talk uh, about in situ preservation, uh, but um, discussing, discussing in situ preservation is also a very important aspect of your uh, ship, the, uh, the uh, Gripschun. Uh, but maybe we will be able to discuss this later uh, during this afternoon or, or tomorrow. So the wood structure, as we know it, you know we have the trunk, we have the the the, um, the race, we have the longitudinal cells, very important. We have the ray cells go, going in the other direction. Then, if you take a look in, in the microscope of the um, and look at the uh, at the waterlogged uh, at this at the wood cell. Uh, we have a, a cell lumen in the middle. Use this one. We have the cell lumen in the middle. Uh, we have a secondary cell wall, mainly consisting of cellulosis and hemicellulosis, and we have the um, the uh, compound middle lamella, mainly consisting of lignin. And so why is wood degraded and how? Well, wood, wood is primarily degraded by biological organisms. And these organisms have specific ecological requirements. In the oxic environment, we know that wood will not last forever. Uh, it will degrade totally. Uh, and the degraders are mainly insects, wood borers, uh, fungi, bacteria, all kinds of rot, as we know it. Whereas when we talk about the anoxic environment, when we talk about the marine uh, environment, um, our enemies are, are um, fewer and, and less aggressive. Um, and they only cause a partial degradation of wood. If we go into the uh, environment where wood is preserved, uh, we have our, our main degrader under the seabed is the erosion bacteria. Uh, the erosion uh, uh, bacteria, uh, it lives in our wood in waterlogged environment, uh, underwater and uh, in wet, uh, wet sites and when there is no oxygen. And the um, the uh, erosion bacteria, uh, it will consume the cellulose and the hemicellulose of the wood, at, but it will leave out the middle lamella. Like you see here, here is the erosion bacteria working. Here it has been working and it leaves out the middle lamella. And this is done at a very slow rate. Um, and. Um, this is why we have the wood, but it's a bit tricky. Uh, well, you can see here first, this is fresh wood uh, in, the, in the microscope where you have the very sound uh, mid lamella and, and secondary walls. This is degraded wood. Uh, and you can again see here, the only thing less left here is the, is the compound mid lamella. But in waterlogged wood, the cell lumen, all these cells are filled with water. And that's our luck, um, because uh, the water uh, keeps the, uh, the wood small, and it keeps the shape of the wood. But it's also tricky, because it makes all the waterlogged artifacts look like being in a very, very good condition. But in fact, they are unstable. Um, and uh, what we want to do with this unstable material is that we want to dry it and bring it to a stable physical and chemical condition. 
And we want to do this um, in a way so that we can avoid collapse and reduce the shrinkage because that are the main problems with this material that once it is dried uncontrolled, it will collapse and it will shrink. And what is collapse? Collapse occurs when you have these tubular cells in the cell wall, very degraded, and the water evaporates uncontrolled from the cell wall. Uh, what happens is that the, you have uh, water, and water has surface tension. Surface tension is very strong. The cell walls is unable to, to, um, to, uh, uh, um, to hold when the, when the water uh, evaporates from the cell walls. So what happens is that the cell walls collapse. It's like it's the same happens when you, try, when you are sucking on a straw and, and, it, and it collapses, it becomes flat. Uh, and this is irreversible. So the result is a material that collapses totally, that you get this, all these flat, uh, flat cells. That's uh, collapse and it happens when you have very degraded capillaries. Shrinkage. Uh, it occurs when you have, you know, in wood, you, have, uh, you can have uh, free water. This is the cell lumen where you have free water and you have, you have um, bound water in the cell wall. The first water to evaporate is the, is the part that comes from, from the free water, from, from the cell lumen. Then you come down to the fiber saturation point and the cell wall is still swollen. Then you're drying it down to um, normal hum uh, relative humidity, around 50% relative humidity. And then you have shrinkage in the individual cell walls. That is shrinkage. Uh, and that happens in all kinds of wood, even, even fresh wood. The problem is that if you look at this here, this table here, uh, shrinkage and collapse, they, call, they cause dimensional changes in all types of wood. But if you see here, this is fresh oak. Fresh oak has a density, normal density between 500 and 600 kilogram per cubic meter. Um, and um, this is the shrinkage curve from zero to 100. Fresh oak, will, will uh, shrink very little in the longitudinal direction, a bit more in, in the radial direction, about 8% in the, long, uh, in, the, in the tangential direction, and the volumetric shrinkage about, about 12 to 15. What happens is when, when the density uh, decreases, the shrinkage also will, will, uh, will increase. Um, and the first part, then you have, uh, that is what we call shrinkage, but when the degradation is even, even uh, more serious, they have collapse. Um, so that's the problem with shrinkage and collapse and uncontrolled drying of waterlogged wood. So a very good thing to do when you have a, uh, a sick patient is to find what is the exact condition of this patient, of this degraded wood. Uh, we can con estimate this condition to, uh, to give it the right cure and to, to find the right conservation method and also to, to, to give it the best, um, the best possible conditions after cons conservation. We are looking for some physical properties such as wood density, strength, uh, water content and the overall degradation pattern. And we are looking for the chemical properties such as for example, is there iron, is there sulfur, salts? But also, it's very interesting if there are <coughs> pigments on the surface because they can give us information about paintings. And it will also have both these, these uh, types of information will have influence on, on the, our conservation methods. So when you look at degradation of wood, the degradation starts in the surface and proceeds into the interior of wood. And uh, sometimes this very degraded la layer is, is, uh, is big, and in, in other, other parts, it's smaller. Uh, normally, we would say that, that the, 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 the area in the A area, it has a risk to collapse, whereas the other layers, you will have the risk of, of serious shrinkage. But in any case, the surface of the wood is very often where we find also 
very important information. That's where we find painting, that's where we find uh, uh, and, um, the uh, traces of uh, O'Toole marks uh, and carvings, runes, whatever. So very much information is, is situated in the surface of the wood. So I'll just present just two, two methods here for, for how to characterize the wood. And, uh, and uh, this is a method that will, uh, that will be applied for, the, for, the, um, for our monster head. Uh, it's a very, very new technique. Um, um, and um, in fact, it can map the, um, the degradation pattern of a full object. The system is that you have this this instrument. It's based upon the technique. It's based it's based upon the old pilotan. Uh, some of you may may know the pilotan, but this here, this instrument has a needle here, and it's uh, combined with with um, with the diving um, equipment. The needle is pressed gradually into the wood at a certain speed. And by reading, by knowing the diameter of the needle, by knowing the speed of the needle and the depth, it is read out here, then you can get very much information about that piece of wood. Uh, so you can make a full degradation pattern uh, out of wood. Uh, you can uh, localize collapsible zones. You can calculate the impregnation time, and you can also design your drying process. Uh, and you will not have to take any sample of the object using this method. Another uh, um, type of uh, investigation that can be useful is to use the XRF analyzer. An analyzer. And um, that's X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. And that can be very useful in the surface to identify pigments and, and salts, and, and, and it's used for, for uh, identification of inorganic elements altogether. Um, and uh, and uh, the information about the inorganic elements is imp also important when we design the, the conservation uh, process, what chemicals to use, and also the, the post-conservation treatments. And again, sampling is not necessary when using this, this method. You just hold it on the top and it gives it. For its, in this case, you have calcium and there is iron. I mean, iron you can recognize without using that one. But, but in any case, this now is that the, these are easy to do and they, they, only, they, they will not require any sampling of the wood. But it gives you a brief uh, or a good indication of where you are with, with your object prior to, prior to conservation. Then when we do that, when we know this, how will we conserve typically a piece of wood like this? The most used method for the moment is in particular in Scandinavia, in Canada, in, in, in the UK, uh, is to uh, freeze dry the wood after impregnation with polyethylene glycol. And we prefer to use PEG uh, 2000. Freeze drying is a method that prevents collapse of the wood during drying as the, as the free water is removed by sublimation. PEG 2000 uh, impregnation will, um, will replace the bound water in the cell wall and reduce shrinkage in the wall. It will replace some of the missing wood in the cell lumen and thus it will stabilize the artifact. Also, the peg will reduce the risk of volume changes in the wood during the freezes, freeze, as it freezes. You know, ice will uh, always increase when you, when you freeze it. By adding peg, this, uh, this uh, increase of, uh, of ice will, uh, will be reduced. So this is a peg molecule with carbons, hydrogen, and oxygen. It's a very simple, simple structure. It's water soluble, it's not toxic. It's solid at room temperature. This is very, very important. Uh, also, it gives a fast, a relatively fast and deep penetration during impregnation. And when I say fast, I know that I'm not, I mean, fast can be many, many different things. Um, come back to that. <laughs> uh, but, it, but also the PEG 2000 
uh, has, has good properties for the vacuum freeze drying process. Very important also, PEG 2000 um, is not a media for moving uh, ions. If you, have, if you have metal ions in your, in your object, such as iron for example, uh, the PEG is so stable that it will not transport these ions in the object after drying if it's kept, uh, kept, kept in, a, in a stable condition. So, so PEG 2000 is, is very good also if you find, if you have traces of, uh, of uh, metal ions in your object, um, uh, in particular iron, um, PEG 2000 will still be able to, to cope with it. Um, also, uh, uh, objects that are treated with PEG 2000, they are stable up to a relative humidity of 80%. So the objects, the waterlogged objects, they are placed in the tank with water and PEG. The impregnation goes by diffusion, so into the cell lumen and then into the cell wall. And um, here are some of our impregnation tanks in Breda. And uh, the question is always, how long does it take? Well, the impregnation time depends upon the volume of the object. It depends on the degree of degradation. It depends on uh, the impregnation agent, the, the size of the, the molecular size of the impregnation agent, the temperature of your bath, and also your end concentration. We normally use up to 40% PEG 2000. And um, it can take from months up till years. And uh, by using the, the uh, technique that I mentioned before, with, with mapping the, uh, the uh, degree of degradation, we will in fact be, uh, be able to, to give a very good estimate of how long, the estimate, uh, how long time the, uh, the, uh, uh, the head Will, will need for the impregnation. It will be very, very useful. So I'll come back just a bit to, to freeze drying. When the object has been, when our artifact has been in the impregnation bath for months or years or whatever, it's ready for freeze drying. Uh, and the, um, in, up to the uh, 90s, uh, beginning of the 90s, it was normal procedure just to let the wood air dry after impregnation. It's so like the example I see here, this is the cell wall. This should uh, indicate the PG and this should be the water, more or less. And when, when water evaporates from, uh, from the cell wall, you, can, you may still have the shrinkage in the surface because you still have the, water, uh, the surface tension of the water um, 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 exceeding the capillary forces of the wood. But if you freeze dry, you take the entire impregnated structure, you put it in the freezer, and when it freezes, you, you have this the shape here, and when it's frozen, that's when you start the sublimation. You know water has three phases. You have it on ice, as ice, as liquid, and vapor. And um, the, the accident happens when, when, uh, when, uh, when water is allowed to evaporate from a liquid. But the thing is, is that when you freeze water and applies pressure or uh, applies vacuum to it, ice can go directly to vapor. So that's what happens in the freeze drying process is that you put it in a chamber and you uh, apply vacuum and the ice converts directly to vapor. You still have this, the original shape of each cell the ice uh, evaporates and the polyethylene glycol is left in the object. So this is a chamber. The ice is transferred by a vacuum pump to a condenser, which is colder. And you can, in fact, see when, as, as ice is, tra is being trapped in the condenser that you are moving the ice out of the object. And the process is the same uh, regardless of type or, or size of chamber. After drying, uh, there will normally be some excess PEG, the white you see here, looks like snow. Uh, it has to be removed. 
then parts are glued and, and uh, the object can be packed for storage or maybe considered uh, prepared for exhibition with a special support. Um, after conservation, uh, wood that has been impregnated with PEG 2000 and freeze dried, they can be exhibited at normal uh, museum climate, which I consider as being between 40 and 60 percent temperature between 15 and 25 degrees Celsius, a normal a medium uh, light level. The only critical part is the UV because UV light can degrade the polyethylene glycol. So that, is, that are the main uh, figures uh, regarding, uh, regarding polyethylene glycol. Uh, this was a very short and or brief introduction to conservation and there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, you can ask me questions now or we can continue in the afternoon or later because this is just a tiny part of, of what I'm working with in Breda. But I wish you all the kind of luck for the preservation of your marvelous monster. <laughs> you certainly showed us some, some very handy tools there, I mean, which I've never seen before. Yeah. Is, is there a short question? Um, uh, yes, I think you were first. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, I would like to ask you if you know what is happening right now with the Boston. Shipwreck. With the Vasa shipwreck? Yeah. Well, I think for now they are, well, well unfortunately for the operation is here, but, uh, but uh, I know they are working, they have got, they got a new climate system in the museum, which is very, very important. Uh, and uh, having a stable climate is, is really important because you, have the, you still have the iron and you still have the, the sulfur, and it's impossible to remove it. I mean, it's no way. Uh, so, the, so what you can do is that you can have a, try to achieve a stable climate. That's the best thing you can do for, do for it. And also, uh, because it is changing, it is, it is uh, uh, the, the old structure wasn't strong enough. They are making a new structure to, to hold the entire ship. And I think those two actions are maybe the best things you can, you can do for, for the Vasa uh, for the moment. So I think they, but they are continuously monitoring uh, and, and, and checking it. Yeah. Yeah. But we might come back to that question because yeah. the director is coming yeah, and, uh, uh, yeah. in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the director yeah. of the whole of the world. Yeah. And, and that's true because the he, they would probably know more, more about the current situation of Vasa than I do. But was it pig also? That was also pegged, but it was a different peg, okay. and it was not freeze dry. And that's why I'm pointing out that it's very important that you choose the right peg and that you don't mistreat your peg on the way, and that you dry the object so we have a dry and porous object. And that is one of the good things about freeze drying, you still have a porous structure, meaning that you don't have all this wet, sluggy part where you can have water transportation and it's not stable. Having a real dry, porous object is, is the, that's, that's, the, that's the clue with, with, uh, with vacuum freeze drying. And as when, when you start to add lower level of peg, to, to for example, to reduce shrinkage, that is one of the ways you, you can, fact, in fact, introduce something that causes chemical instability to the object. Did you have another question? No, no, this was actually what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, okay. Not even no. I'm just wondering, like, what are the risks with the freeze-drying process for the using? Very loudly. Uh, what are the risks of using this method for conservation? Yeah. Are there any negative effects that we might have to like, reconsider uh, before performing this? Or oh, the drying process? Yeah. Are there any negative uh, are there any risks? Yes, yes, there are. And there is always the problem that wood is wood in particular oak wood, and in particular where you have the core, because oak wood tends to split. All, all wood will, will split upon drying. And I don't know where the pit is uh, in, in this particular object. It could be in the bottom, it could be in the top, but uh, the closer you are to the middle, then there's a, there's a, there's a chance that, that they are evenly spread. If you are unlucky, you will have a gap just through the, through, the, through the top of it. Uh, that's, that's the nature of wood. 
and that's very, very difficult to do something about. I mean, then you might have to do something very, very intrusive to the object. Um, also, warping is also is, is can be a can be a problem always because, in particular, if you have, if you have an object where the pit is is maybe diagonally going through the object, then you can have it go like this and twist. Um, I mean, yeah, it we are working with a with a natural biological material, and it still seems to remember how it was a thousand years ago. Yeah. Maria lost. Uh, yeah, just about the uh, good profile recorder. Like, completely yeah, about yeah. that. I don't know if you already tried, but I would like to know if it would be possible to have the kind of machine to use under the water. It was it was originally designed for going under water, uh, but it's very expensive to use under water. So the, in fact, the one that they will bring here is is uh, is the one they're making. They make for under water. Uh, but they were trying to make a, a smaller one or an easier one for uh, more laboratory landings. So you yeah. see the most observation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Th thank you very much. We are, we are going to con continue with more. The next speaker is Hans. No.